Hello everybody, I'm Ajit K. Mishra, your course instructor for literature and coping skills. I'm here again with another lecture of this module that is called Defeating Depression. So as you all know, in my last two lectures on this module, I talked about various aspects of depression including touch and uh, feeling absolutely disturbed and a variety of other things. So today I'm going to talk about a very important aspect of this particular idea that is uh, depression and how we can develop uh, certain coping skills and strategies to defeat depression comprehensively. So let's take a look at each of these components. I have already talked about uh, feeling weird and losing touch. If you remember, I talked about depression and its various aspects in that first lecture in this material. Then I moved on to talking about feeling weird, losing touch part two, in which I talked about touch starvation in great detail. So today I'm going to focus on this particular aspect and after this discussion or this lecture, I'm going to talk about the last segment. So today I'm going to talk about Alfred Lord Tennyson's Break, Break, Break. I'm going to show you how this particular poetic composition can help us understand the processes, the stages through which we can develop skills, or we can devise strategies to defeat depression. So let's start with today's uh, lecture. So this is exactly what I'm going to do today. I will talk about break, break, break. But before I bring in that poetic piece, I'll be starting with a few introductory elements so that you get a graded exposure to the idea of defeating depression with the help of a poetic composition. And this is a very, very interesting uh, lecture because in this lecture I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how this particular poetic composition actually brings us face to face with the idea of developing certain skills which will help us either cope in a, in a positive way or cope in a negative way. So it remains to be seen whether this particular poetic composition helps us cope with the onslaught of depression or not. So as we move uh, I can tell you that I'm going to talk about situational depression today. This is a very different kind of depression and it has not been included in the DSM uh, as a mental disorder. But it has all the components of the major depressive disorder. So situational depression as you all probably know or you can guess from the name itself that it is dependent on a certain situation. So if you are faced suddenly with a kind of situation that disturbs you a lot, then there is every possibility that you will begin to experience a situational depression. So uh, when that happens, it will uh, definitely push you into the realm of the dark, the depression in multiple ways. So because situational depression is also called a reactive depression. Reactive depression because we react to certain situations, to certain events in a certain manner. So these reactions are so sudden, so intense, so grief stricken that we, we uh, promptly enter into the realm of the dark, the depressive realm. So these this, uh, depressive uh, uh, phases generally occur when we come face to face with a situation and then we uh, register a certain kind of reaction and as a result of that reaction, this kind of depression uh, we experience. Um, the German psychiatrist Kurt Schneider coined uh, the terms uh, uh, endogenous depression and reactive depressions in 1920. Endogenous depression is all about uh, you know, finding the cause of your depression within. 
uh, that means there is something that uh, disturbs you from within it can be genetically um, uh, tuned or featured or it can be something else that disturbs you from within as a result of which you are experiencing some depressive bouts. So that is endogenous uh, uh, depression. The other type of depression is this that is a reactive uh, depression which we uh, also call by the name situational depression. So as early as 1920 uh, this German psychiatrist was able to uh, discover the symptoms of these two very different kinds of depression. Situational depression is a short term stress related type of depression. So that's that's probably one big reason why it is not treated as uh, a depressive disorder or a major depressive disorder because uh, uh, it doesn't last for a prolonged period. So it has a very very short life but that's not the reality in all cases. There are instances in which this kind of depression doesn't leave, doesn't go or doesn't pass off. It remains with a person who is afflicted with this depression. So in such cases there is not much difference between this kind of depression and major depressive disorder. So it's very, very important that we uh, look for the intensity and the duration of such depressive attacks or, or bouts so that we get to know whether it's a short term stress related type of depression or it's a long term and has all the elements of a major depressive disorder. Depression as we all know by now is in fact uh, a state of low mood and an aversion to activity. These two are very, very important when it comes to our understanding of depression. So depression results in low mood, persistent and constant low mood and aversion to activity. That means you don't feel like doing anything. You will find that you have suddenly become helpless, hopeless, worthless. Therefore, you will not take any interest in any activities in life. So that is exactly when uh, your motivation, your feelings, your thoughts, your sense of well-being will be affected by those depressive bouts. And these are some of uh, uh, the symptoms of uh, depression and a core uh, symptom of uh, depression uh, is that you experience anhedonia. That means the loss of pleasure. You do not take any interest in anything. However, uh, pleasing or entertaining or enjoyable those experiences may be. So anhedonia is a major uh, symptom of major depressive disorder. But when we look at situational depression, we also find that it has several uh, similarities with the major depressive disorder. So therefore, at times the, the distinction or the division between uh, situational or reactive disorder or depression and major depressive disorder seems to be very, very thin and blurred. So I have already told you that it has not been recognized as a clinical disorder, yet it has all the symptoms of major depressive disorder, MDT. And it can promptly turn into or transform into MDD if not taken care of in a proper manner. So therefore, it's very, very important that we understand that situational depression or reactive depression has all the elements of promptly turning into a major depressive disorder if we do not take care of it. So, it's important for us to understand the triggers of situational depression. What are the causes of situational depression generally? So, when you take a look at the causes of uh, situational depression, 
you'll find a lot of similarities between these and those of the major depressive disorder. So there has to be a traumatic event. It can be the sudden loss of a loved one. It can be divorce. It can be uh, sudden stress. Uh, you are suddenly faced with a stressful situation and you, you're frozen. You do not know what to do about it. So, and that causes a lot of pain and suffering in you. So if that event turns out to be traumatic, then it has the potential to cause situational depression in you. So it can also be due to a major life change. Uh, sometimes this can be positive life changes. For example, somebody is getting married to somebody else and that person can also experience depression because the person will be visited by a lot of uh, uh, questions um, and ideas. Uh, so the person may experience depression. So major life changes, uh, including uh, marriage and uh, you know loss, uh, trauma, can also result in situational or reactive depression. And then serious accident, of course. So, so when somebody meets with a serious accident, uh, I mean an accident uh, that renders the person either visible or uh, you know leads to the amputation of uh, any of the limbs of the person. So such uh, serious accidents uh, also have the potential to lead to uh, this kind of depression. That's a reactive depression. And then divorce, I have already told you all that divorce has that uh, potential, has the power to suddenly push somebody into uh, situational depression because uh, especially when uh, divorce is sudden. I mean, if, if a couple are contemplating the idea of divorce uh, uh, for quite some time, then the onslaught, the impact of the onslaught will be less and it might not lead to situational depression because both the couples are aware of it and they are probably working towards uh, 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 a proper divorce, so an and, uh, amicable divorce. Uh, so that way uh, that may not lead to situational depression. if. Uh, uh, divorce is a sudden one, unexpected one, and uh, if it's one-sided, it will cause uh, situational depression to the other side. So that's the difference. And then job loss, we all know. I mean, one fine morning if an employee reaches his or her office and within uh, minutes uh, gets to learn that he or she is no more a part of that company, not on uh, the job uh, a list of that company. So there is every possibility that such a person will experience situational depression. And then finally, the death of a loved one. This has been uh, considered uh, one of the major causes of situational depression, the death of a loved one, because these are the situation for which we are never prepared. We can be uh, prepared for job losses, divorce. Uh, uh, we are not prepared for serious accident. We can be prepared for major life changes uh, and a variety of other things. But we are not prepared for uh, a few things. And this is one such thing. So death of a loved one turns out to be a major contributor to situational or reactive depression. So that's uh, the reason why uh, I'm going to focus on this particular thing and with the help of Break, Break, Break by Tennyson, I'm going to talk about the impact that the death of a loved one leaves on a person's psyche, on a sufferer's psyche and how that leads to situational depression or reactive depression. So situational depression has uh, certain symptoms on the basis of which uh, a trained uh, uh, psychiatrist or psychotherapist can tell whether uh, a person is uh, experiencing reactive and situational depression or not. So there are a few symptoms 
that includes a feeling of low mood and sadness which are similar to uh, that of uh, MDD and then hopelessness again lack of motivation I told you that's uh, uh, in fact uh, caused by depression or MDD and then loss of pleasure and hedonia again an MDD uh, element and then withdrawing from normal activities such people begin to withdraw from normal life or normal life activities and then get stuck in one particular thing only they are stuck in that loss in that trauma and do not do anything special to move out of it and focus on the other aspects of life so this is um, a very very important symptom of situational depression and then loneliness or social isolation such people since they withdraw uh, from normal activities they find it extremely difficult uh, to be in the company of other people because they continue to think about the loss they are so engrossed in that loss that even being in the company of other people they are not there so that's uh, one big reason why uh, such people also experience social isolation and then such people also contemplate uh, uh, suicide because they experience thoughts of suicide because they suddenly uh, begin to uh, think that their life has been rendered useless and futile by that particular life-changing uh, event or situation therefore they do not have any further interest in their lives and they would like to put an end to all this suffering so they are also visited by the thoughts of suicide and then we come to a very important uh, uh, symptom which is frequent bouts of grief and mourning so such people begin to cry uh, quite often they experience grief and they also um, you know uh, express grief so grief turns out to be uh, the most important activity for such people they always grieve they always uh, find themselves in an aggrieved state so uh, i'm also going to focus on uh, the idea of grief in relation to uh, break 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 by tennyson so that uh, uh, takes us to the idea of uh, the poetic composition now we can focus on uh, the poetic composition with these important things in mind since i have told you that i'm going to talk about grief it's very important for all of us to understand the importance of grief the role of grief in our lives by now you all know that there is no such classification as negative and positive emotions such a classification exists for the sake of knowing the difference between one type of emotion or one aspect of the same emotion and the other aspect of it but there is no such classification the same emotion can turn out to be negative which is otherwise perceived or seen as a positive emotion for example love when it becomes unscrupulous uncontrollable when it becomes an obsession it can promptly turn into a negative emotion it can destroy the person who experiences it and it can also destroy the person for whom this person experiences that particular emotion so love here may not be uh, a positive emotion so when it comes to distinguish between emotions a better idea is to go by the valency quotient whether an emotion has a positive valence or a negative valence so on the basis of that we can say whether an emotion is going to exercise a positive impact or a negative impact on the person who experiences that similarly when it comes to sadness grief fear uh, all those uh, emotions that are otherwise negatively perceived they all have a uh, huge and important positive roles in our lives and existence 
I have talked about all those things in detail. Similarly, when it comes to grief, it also has certain positive aspects. It in fact prepares us. It in fact uh, helps us heal. And that's the reason why learning about uh, emotions after loss, especially those emotions that we experience after loss, can in fact heal us. But they can heal us only when we allow them to do so. If we do not allow grief to heal us, it will not heal us. It will continue to disturb us. So the decision lies not in that emotion, but in the person who experiences that particular emotion. So grief is most often perceived as a cloud burst. Or depression um, uh, is also perceived as a cloud burst, a sudden cloud burst. So that's the reason why most people associate depression with uh, you know, an, a downpour or a sudden outburst of rain. So grief can be a healing if we allow it to do so and if we allow ourselves to pass through these distinct stages of grief. There are five of them. If we take care of each of these stages, if we understand these stages properly, it will be easy for us to take care of our grief. Whenever there is grief, a person begins by denial. So, a person begins by denying that that has happened because the person is not prepared to accept that this particular thing has happened. In this case, if somebody is dead, the person who is suffering from that grief may say, he's not gone, he'll come back any moment. I'm not prepared to believe that that person is dead, that person is no more, and he or she is gone. The person can come back any moment, I'm not prepared. And this is something that we all have come across. People generally start by denying. So they start with denial. They say that, no, that cannot be. That person cannot die. He was so healthy and happy, cheerful, that person cannot commit suicide. We are, we are taken aback, we are shocked. Therefore, we begin by denying that it can happen or it has happened. So during the denial stage, we don't accept it. And then we uh, begin to accept that, yes, it's true. When that phase is over, we enter another phase. That's the phase of anger. Then we begin to focus on the person. Say, the person should have taken extra care. The person shouldn't have been so reckless um, about his or her diet or driving if it's an accident. If he cared for himself more, this wouldn't have happened. So, we are not necessarily angry with the person, but we are expressing our anger, our displeasure for something that the person has probably not done. So, denial has been replaced by anger. In this stage, we will express our anger, our displeasure. And once this phase is over, we'll enter this phase, the bargaining phase. In this phase, we're going to engage in a lot of what if or if things or if questions. If I had stopped him from going out, driving his vehicle, he wouldn't have died. What if I had asked the person to be with me uh, tonight or here, the person wouldn't have been gone. So if only I had stopped him that night, he wouldn't be gone. So in this stage, the shift can be seen, which is taken away from the person who is gone to the person who is suffering. So in the previous uh, stage, the focus is on the person who is gone. 
And in this stage, the focus shifts from the person who is gone to the person who is suffering, who is bearing the brunt of that event, that trauma, that crisis, that life-changing event. So, beyond the bargaining stage of grief, we come across to the other stage. And this is a very, very important stage. Everyone who is aggrieved, who is bereaved, passes through this particular phase, the depression phase. This depression phase uh, is divided into two parts. The first is the person focuses on the things that were there and then suddenly shifts his or her attention to those things that are not there. That means if somebody has lost one's friend, the person focuses on the things that he and his friends did together, those wonderful things, moments, and suddenly shifts to the things that, or the, the current state that those things are absent, are gone forever now. So there's a sudden shift to loss. And that's very, very important. With this shift, if the person's psychological focus gets stuck in the current state that is loss, then that will lead to severe problems for the person. The person will not be able to overcome this particular stage or come out of this particular stage. So that the person experiences the healing power of grief, it's very important that the person comes out of this stage and doesn't allow this stage to be a prolonged one. So what am I without him? So you begin to devalue yourself, develop self-hatred, and then you know you also engage in self-blame, and then you say, I'm, I'm hopeless, I'm worthless, I'm useless without that person. Now that the person is gone, this life is useless, I'm useless, I'm worthless. What will I do with this life now? Because I'm nothing without that person. So this is the phase where several things may happen. The person may contemplate suicide. The person may not be able to you know, come out of this stage. So this is the most important grief stage. Once a person is able to overcome this stage, and how does that happen? It's only when the person is ready to shift the perspective from what is gone to what is on. That's, that means what, what is happening around. So from what is gone to what is on, there has to be a shift of one's perception. Therefore, this stage is called the acceptance stage, in which a person you know, generally says, I'm so fortunate to have had so many wonderful years with him, and he'll always be in my memories. So those memories, those wonderful moments that a person has shared with the other person who is gone forever will help the person come out of the depression stage and say, I, I will um, always uh, cherish those wonderful moments and the person will always be alive in my memories. So these are some of those approaches that will help the grieving person, the sufferer, come out of the depression stage and enter the acceptance stage. And once the person enters the acceptance stage, the healing cycle will be complete. Otherwise, the acceptance stage will never ever happen and the person will get stuck in the depression stage. So with that, uh, we'll switch to the other ideas. But before that, I must tell you all that this is a model of grief that was developed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the American Swiss psychiatrist. And this, is, this has been extremely popular among scholars of grief. With that, we, we come to uh, Break, Break, Break by Tennyson. And we'll see whether the problem that the speaker is struggling with finally disappears because the speaker has developed certain coping skills and the speaker has devised certain coping strategies with the help of which the speaker 
is finally able to overcome the problem. Okay, so let me give you a quick uh, idea uh, of what this poetic composition is all about. Break, break, break is an elegy, I mean a sad poem, which is composed on the sudden demise, death of the poet's closest friend, Arthur Hallam. So that way we know that this poem is composed on the death, the sudden death of a loved one. So the sudden death of a loved one, grief, that means situational depression. There is an element of situational depression or reactive depression, one. And the second is, there is an element of grief, since it is an elegy, a mourning, lamentation. And then we'll notice, we'll get to know how does the speaker cope with the problem or whether the speaker actually copes with the problem or not. So let's take a quick look at this poetic composition. So it has four uh, stanzas and uh, very nicely uh, designed and uh, symmetrical stanzas or lines. So when you take a look at uh, the first stanza, the first four lines, you'll get an image of death, pain and suffering. So break, 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 suffering, pain, and then on thy cold grey stones, image of death, cold grey stone, all lifeless things. So that, that creates an image of death right in front of us. We get to know that there, there has been a death. And that has been a life-changing event. That has been a stressful, traumatic event for the speaker. And then there is an address to somebody. And who is that somebody? That somebody has been personified. O.C. So that's a mournful address to O.C. So, and then uh, uh, we come to the second part of the stanza where we see that the speaker is still struggling with the problem of being able to talk, being able to articulate his emotions well. So if you all remember, I talked about, uh, you know, how most people struggle with the, um, the desire to speak. I have so much to speak, but I don't know how to do that. Now the poet is also, the, the speaker is also um, struggling with a similar problem, that is of not being able to speak. Therefore, my tongue could utter the thoughts that arise in me. I have a lot of thoughts in me, but I am sorry to say that my tongue cannot articulate or utter those words. I don't have those words. I am speechless. So that means there is a confession to the fact that the speaker is not being able to articulate his uh, pain and suffering properly. So when we come across all these things, we get to see break, 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 an instance of pain and suffering, and then an image of death. And then there is an attempt at speaking to somebody. I have talked about talk therapy. So this is an instance of that the, the speaker is trying to speak to somebody by addressing somebody, by personifying somebody. But the problem is, in this case, it's not a human. So when you are talking to somebody who cannot intervene, your talking to that person becomes futile. It's, it doesn't achieve its desired uh, result. So that's the problem. Uh, there is still a gap. And then I cannot articulate all my feelings or thoughts. So that's an inability which the speaker accepts, confesses. So if you cannot name it, it will be extremely difficult for you to tame it. Since the person cannot completely or fully name it, the person finds it extremely difficult to tame it. And then 
something interesting happens, something positive happens. There is a sudden shift from one particular perspective, that is the perspective of death, inability, helplessness, worthlessness, to something that is worthwhile, that is full of life, and that's quite positive. So now there is a perspective shift. And this perspective shift is a wonderful coping skill that we all require in order to take care of our challenging emotions, disturbing emotions. So the speaker does that. The speaker suddenly shifts the perspective from the, the idea, the image of death to the image of life. Now what we get to see is the fisherman's boy is playing with his sister and they are making merry, they are laughing, they are shouting, they are so happy. So they are enjoying a lot. Similarly, the sailor lad also singing in his boat on the bay. So that's also an instance of life. The boat on the bay, the sailor lad is also singing. But there is some problem with these expressions, which you might have taken note of. The first is this, and then there is a contrast between these two things. The first is O, and the same O is repeated in the second instance as well. O, well for the sailor lad. So when O is repeated twice, back to back, we get to know that there is something important about this O. And this is not the other O that has an H after the O. So this very different kind of O which is very wistful and mournful. That O with an H is indicative of the pain and suffering. But in this case, there is something beyond the pain and the speaker is in fact mourning. So therefore, the use of O back to back. And this is the same O which was used with OC. There is mourning, there is a wistful thinking. And when we switch to the other part of it, we get to see similar things and the stately ships go on to their heaven under the hill. So again, something that is indicative of life. The stately ships go on. So moving on, movement, indicative of life. But there is a sudden return to the same old state. But, oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. So, the perspective shift which had happened six lines ago suddenly ends and the, the speaker returns to the same old state of mourning, grieving, lamenting. And the same old state of focusing on the loss rather than trying things to move out of the loss. So you can see that there was an attempt at moving out of the grief stage to the acceptance stage. But there is a sudden recoiling as a result of which the speaker returns to the same mode or the same state again. Plus, there is something very interesting which you might have noticed here. Touch of a vanished hand. This is a classic example of touch starvation or touch deprivation or skin hunger. I have talked about touch starvation in detail in one of my previous lectures, if you remember. Touch starvation can lead to severe mental problems and that's one instance of it. The person, the speaker, is in fact striving for the touch 
of his friend. He's missing the touch of his friend a lot. Therefore, but oh for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. Still means again the image of death, stillness that is death. So you can see the recursive pattern here. We started with break, break, break and then we are re-entering the same manhole, the same dark realm again. Break, break, break. At the foot of thy cracks, O sea, but the tender grace of a day that is dead will never come back to me. So, what we get to see is this particular poetic composition has 16 lines, if you have counted the lines, out of which 10 lines have been devoted to the image of death and only six lines have been devoted to the image of life. Now you can tell the difference. When somebody focuses so much on the image of death, it shows as if the person has developed some kind of infatuation for or obsession with the objects of death. And the person is stuck. It's a, you know, it's a psychological myopia and emotional catatonia. The person is stuck in that particular point, stuck, stuck in loss, and the person is unable to move beyond it. So that's, that's exactly what I talked about before I started discussing this poem. I wanted you to take a look at it so that you can tell what else the speaker should have done in order to overcome the problem, that is, of the sudden loss of his closest friend. And what should the poet or the speaker have done in order to overcome the situational depression and touch starvation? So, this is one uh, important instance in which there is uh, an element of coping which is partial and which is incomplete. So, that brings us to the idea of the challenges that we generally encounter in this particular poetic composition. So, there is situational or reactive depression because loss of a loved one, that is a friend of the speaker. And we also see there is an adjustment disorder because situational depression is also synonymous with adjustment disorder because it leads to an adjustment disorder. So, you suddenly find it very, very difficult to adjust because you cannot accept Therefore, it becomes difficult to adjust. Touch starvation. There is touch starvation which is established from the statement that but for the touch of a vanished hand. So, there is touch starvation. So, when touch starvation sets in, people will experience bouts of depression. And then, this important thing, the grief which should have healed the person, the speaker, in fact turns out to be the cause of concern, turns out to you know, give more and more pain to the person because it is an instance of complicated or unresolved grief. Complicated grief becomes an ongoing process where mourning is an ongoing process. So, you can see the use of O right from the beginning of the poetic composition, this particular poetic composition, to the end of it. So, there is mourning everywhere. So, that means in complicated unresolved grief, the mourning becomes an ongoing process. It continues forever and the person uh, becomes unable to overcome the setback, the loss. And there is also negative visualization. That means, we do not get a single line about the happy times that both the friends spent together. There is not a single line about it. There is no image of that. So, there is no talk about the happy times. So, if you remember in the acceptance stage, a person needs to, you know, recall those wonderful cherishable memories of the past. That will help the person enter the acceptance stage 
that doesn't happen here because there is no visualization of any happier moments. And there is psychological stuckness. The person is stuck in the idea of loss, death, nothing else. So when that happens, that leads to complicated or unresolved grief. That means a person cannot see anything else except that particular thing. So there is a moment, there is an opportunity for the speaker in the uh, poem where he tries to see how uh, this fisherman's uh, children are playing, the sailor lad is singing, the stately ships are moving to their safe uh, places. But those images, those happenings have not been able to you know, help the person overcome his psychological stuckness. He's stuck, he's frozen. And then grief mismanagement. The person is not able to manage grief properly. So we need the right kind of grief management. So when it comes to grief management, we need to focus on this idea because that's a wonderful skill. Because we all are bound to experience grief. There is no one in this world who will not be faced with grief of any kind. So when grief is the ultimate reality, it's better that we learn how to manage grief well. So with the help of uh, this particular model developed or offered by Colin Parks, I'm going to talk about grief management. I must tell you all that Colin Parks has modeled this model of his upon the model of Kubler-Ross, the five stages of grief. So you'll find a lot of similarities between uh, kubler Russ model of grief and this model of grief by Colin Parks. So we all start with shock and numbness. We cannot believe that something has happened. We suddenly feel we are frozen. And then we develop a yearning and we begin to search for the person who is gone. We, we begin to search the thing that we have lost. We begin to bring the lost object back into our lives. And therefore, this wistfulness or yearning. So yearning is exactly what we can see all through this poetic composition, break, break, break. And the use of that single letter O is indicative of that yearning. And the searching is still on. The speaker thinks as if it's possible for him to bring back his old friend or his dead friend to life, which is not a possibility anymore. But the searching is on. Although the speaker says at the end of that poem that that will never come back to me, but the speaker doesn't say that I'm going to stop this search now. There is no hint, there is no indication that the search will also come to an end. And that's the reason why the speaker is unable to cope with the problems. All those problems that I talked about a while ago. And then there is this despair and disorganization stage which nobody can help. Everyone is bound to pass through these stages of despair and disorganization. You'll feel as if you're being disorganized, you're fragmented. But beyond that stage, there is this reorganization stage and recovery stage. And that's how people recover from their griefs. Only by accepting the fact, only by shifting their focus that, yes, there is something else that's far more important than just grief, than just this particular thing. There is much beyond this particular happening, this particular life-changing event. There is life beyond this life-changing event. So this particular acceptance is exactly what we all need, but that doesn't happen here. So there is grief mass mismanagement. And then the coping skills and strategies that we come across when we take a look at this poetic composition. These are some of the rights that we come across. For example, 
the speaker begins by accepting the fact that the friend is gone. He has lost his friend. Therefore, he says that I have a lot of things to say, but I don't know how to talk about them. I just wish my tongue could utter. Then uh, there is an occasion when he says that, uh, but for the lost hand, the touch of a lost hand. So that's another instance when he says, yes, the friend is gone. And there is another instance towards the end of the poem when he says, yes, that friend is not coming back to me. So there is another uh, right coping strategy adopted that is moving out. It's a wonderful skill. In fact, it's a wonderful coping skill because everyone who experiences this stuckness needs to move out physically so that it offers you an opportunity to move out psychologically as well. So the person, the speaker tries to move out, but then for how long? It was very short lived. After a short span, the speaker returns to the same old state that is the state of psychological stuckness. So this moving out is curtailed. And then talk therapy. The speaker does engage in talk therapy, but the, uh, but the person the speaker is talking to is not a human. It's a non-human who has been attributed a, a personification. That is OC. The, the speaker is speaking to the C. And the C cannot intervene in this case. And that's exactly what happens. There is no help from C. It's a one-sided communication only. And there are lots of wrongs which could have been turned into rights had the speaker taken care of those things. Now you can fill in these wrongs and then you can think of how the speaker could have turned them into rights. I, in fact, I have used this particular uh, poem uh, because I wanted to show you how not being able to cope with a certain problem can also give us a greater insight into the coping skills and strategies that we can look for in that particular um, attempt, in that particular endeavor. It's an endeavor, of course, but a curtailed endeavor, an incomplete endeavor. Therefore, the grief of the speaker is unresolved. So that's how we come to the end of this lecture. Uh, I hope uh, it has been helpful and it has helped you understand the idea of uh, situational depression or reactive depression and the idea of grief well. Thank you very much for joining me.